to be able to have the Coxes with us today. We are familiar with his mom and dad. We've had them several times in our church as they've shared. Um, but uh, Richard and uh, his wife, Tanya, we're just delighted to have them here. They're uh, on a new adventure, starting a, a new church plant in Altoona, Pennsylvania. And uh, we've asked him to come and share his heart with us today. So if you'll come, please, and, uh, and share. It's exciting to be with you today, uh, especially on uh, your mission service. Uh, missions has been a passion of mine since the time I was a little kid. I remember as a kid some of my favorite missionary stories were people like Hudson Taylor. He was a missionary to China, and when ev many of the other missionaries were afraid to go inland because of the dangers that it entailed, Hudson Taylor left the comforts of the coast of China and went to inland China, began living like the Chinese, dressing like the Chinese, eating like the Chinese, so that more and more people could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hudson Taylor said, in all things not sinful, I will become Chinese so that the lost may hear the gospel. I remember hearing stories of William Carey and how he, he left the comforts of Europe and went to India to be one of the first missionaries in India and how he took the gospel to people that have not heard. And of David Livingston, who, who opened the door into Central and North Africa for many, many missionaries to follow. And all of this because there were people that had not heard the name of Jesus, and it was their mission in life to take the gospel to people that had not heard. So it's no surprise that as a kid, when God began calling me to be a missionary, I naturally assumed that he was calling me to some far remote corner of the world. I mean, isn't that where missionaries go? I mean, all through, from the time I was about five, I started telling my parents, I think God is calling me to be a missionary. And all through my growing up years and all through high school and into college, I continually felt God confirming in my life, I'm calling you to be a missionary. I'm calling you to take the gospel to people that have not heard. So I began preparing to be a missionary. I went to Bible college. And, and yet, starting in my high school years when my parents actually went to Africa as missionaries, I continually kept getting this sense that God was saying, I'm calling you to be a missionary, but I want you to go to North America. And I don't know about you, but I was a little confused. Because God continually, over and over, I would sit in services, I would read my Bible, and over and over, God would confirm, I'm calling you to be a missionary, I'm calling you to take the gospel to people that have not heard. And then God would say, but I'm calling you to America. And for about a six-year period, I was very confused. I was like, God, how can you call me to be a missionary and call me to, to America at the same time? This morning I want to share with you how I feel God is continually calling us to be a missionary and why I feel God has called us to be a missionary here. I don't know about you, but uh, growing up in the North American church before we went to Africa, um, I knew there were people outside the church I knew there were people every week that didn't go to church, but in my mind, I had this idea that they were simply prodigal sons. You know the type. They grow up in the church, but for whatever reason, uh, they walk away from God only to return later in life. And that was my picture of the North American church. But over the last several years, God has really been breaking my heart and opening my eyes to the vast amount of need that is right outside those doors right outside these doors. I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Romans 10, um, starting in verse 9 through 15. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, uh, Romans 10, 9 through 15. It says, if, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I don't know about you, but that's really, really good news. And Paul goes on to say, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. There are two things that Paul is saying in this passage. First, anyone and everyone can be saved. I mean, that is the beautiful uh, story of the gospel. That it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your status, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter who your parents were, or what socioeconomic status you live in. Everybody that calls on the name of Jesus can be saved. That's why we're gathered here today, to celebrate missions, to celebrate the fact that anyone and everyone, and last time I checked, everyone, that includes all people. It doesn't matter what language you speak, everyone that will call on the name of Jesus can be saved and reunited with Jesus. And just as Paul is giving this great news and reminding the church in Rome that everyone can be saved, he puts a clause in there. He's like, everyone can be saved, but. There is a but. He says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? In other words, Paul is saying here that that Muslim family growing up right now in Iraq, they can be saved if they only call out to Jesus, but somebody has to go and tell them. That street child right now that's growing up on the streets of Calcutta and both of his parents have died and he doesn't know where he's going to get his next meal, he can be saved. We gather for mission services and we believe that. If someone will only go and tell them, people can be saved. But do you realize that Paul is also saying that your coworker can be saved? If someone will only tell them? Do you realize that Paul is saying here that your neighbor that is sleeping every Sunday morning when you get up and come to church can be saved if someone will simply tell them? Somewhere along the way in the North American church, we got this idea that every, everyone has heard the gospel in our country. I had someone tell me this. When I first, I, I was sitting down with someone in our church and I was telling them how God has called us to go and start a church in Altoona to reach people that are outside the church that haven't heard the gospel. And they told me, they said, but no one in America has an excuse for hearing the gospel. They said there's so many churches, so many Christian radio stations, so many uh, Christian uh, TV programs that no one in America has an excuse. And you know what? There was a time when I believed that. And I believe there are many in the church that believe that too. But let me ask you this. What would your view of Jesus be in his church if the only thing you knew about Jesus was what you saw in secular TV and secular media? What would you think of Jesus? Just, just for a moment. Just imagine that everything you knew about church that you've learned here or, or in your church experience, you totally forgot it. And the only thing you knew about Jesus was what you saw on secular TV. More than likely, you might think that Jesus was this nice guy that has 
a bunch of radical followers that have abused his teachings and are haters and racist. I mean, that's what you get of Jesus when you watch secular TV. Let me take this a step farther. I'm going to need a little bit of participation at this point. But has anyone here ever read the Koran? Okay, I've got one person that's read portions of the Koran. And that's pretty normal when I travel in churches. Maybe one, sometimes a couple more. And I want, I want to say this before I go on. I believe that Jesus is the only way. And scripture is clear. But think with me for a second. If one person in here has ever taken the time to read the Koran, why do we simply think that our neighbor is going to one day go to Walmart and pick up a Bible and decide to read it and find Jesus? I mean, if, we, if only one person here has ever taken the time to read the Koran, why do we think that our neighbor or our coworker is simply going to go looking for Jesus on their own unless someone goes and tells them? You know, there are many stories of people that pick up a Bible and begin to read the Bible. But in 99.999% uh, or times, it's because someone in their life was living Jesus in front of them and was actively sharing Jesus with them. And they said, you know what, there's something about that. But it rarely happens if no one goes. I, the, the first time that I really began realizing how great the need was here in our own nation, when I, for the last five and a half years, I've been serving on staff at the Hyde Wesleyan Church. And the first summer I was there, we went out and we did a kids club at a local housing development. We decided rather than expecting the kids to come to us, we were going to take the Bible to the kids. And so every Saturday morning we would go and we'd have a kids club with these kids. And we'd, tell them, we'd have a snack and a craft and a game and at the end we'd gather them up in a circle and we'd tell them a Bible story. And I remember as week after week that summer, I would ask them, before I tell the story, I'd say, have you ever heard the story of David and Goliath? And the kids were like, no. Next week, have you ever heard the story of Daniel and the lion's skin? And the kids would look at me, no, I, I know Superman. It wasn't even that these kids were getting the story confused. I mean, sometimes you talk to a kid after they've been in junior church and they, get this, they tell you about how it was Jesus that was swallowed by the whale. Or they get the story confused. That wasn't the case. These kids didn't know the Bible stories. They were growing up totally outside of the church, and yet they could see a church from their house. And it was through experiences like this and many others that God began opening my eyes to just how much need was right here. Within walking distance of many of our churches. Just this last year, I've been involved in a ministry in our community that gives out perishable food items to people in our community. And Before we do it, uh, every week uh, we share a five-minute devotional. And, uh, I was sharing the devotional, and I had five minutes, so I'm like, I'll just reference the prodigal son story uh, rather than sh explaining the story. And so I asked them, how many here know or have heard the prodigal son story? And in a group of 50, only five hands went up. And this was adults. And I was like, whoa. These are people right here that can walk to my church and yet they don't know the gospel clearly. Who's going to tell them? So if there is such a great need to start new churches, what is the state of the church in North America? Do you realize that right now in North America only 18% of Americans are in church on any given weekend? Do you realize that? This weekend, only 18% of Americans will be in church. Oftentimes when I tell people that we're going to start a new church, they, tell, they will say, aren't there too many churches in America? We, I mean, we get this idea that the mission field is in Africa or the mission field is in Asia. I mean, aren't there enough churches here? Let me share a statistic with you that blew my mind. There are 
360,000 churches in America. It seems like a lot of churches, doesn't it? 360,000. But do you realize that if every single church in America were to double attendance by, say, next year, July 1st, your church were to experience revival and double attendance in one year. Can you imagine that? I mean, that would be amazing. But can you imagine what would be even more amazing if every single church in the entire country were to do the same thing? I mean, we would be celebrating, we would be telling the world God has showed up, and do you realize that if every single church in our country were to double attendance, there would still be 190 million people in our country not in church? 190 million people not in church. There's a huge task before us. Do you realize that right now, you, each and every one of you, are living in the fourth largest mission field in the world based on the amount of people in one country living outside the church? When I was living in Africa, there were more people in our nation in church each and every weekend than there are in my own nation. Do you realize that? I am the biggest supporter of missions that you will ever see. But missions has to be everywhere. It's not enough to just simply send our money to the far corners of the world if we're not willing to go to our neighbor. My question for you today is, will the church rise? For many generations, the church has risen to to the call of missions, and we've sent missionaries around the world. But will the church rise today to meet the need in our own generation? Keith Green, uh, a Christian musician, Uh, once was quoted as saying, this generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of souls on the earth. You know what? We really don't have much responsibility, or we don't have any responsibility for those that have gone before us. What is done is done. And you know what? Other than living an example for those that come behind us, we really have no responsibility of future generations. But each and every one of us, when we face Christ on Judgment Day, are going to be asked, what, what did you do with the resources I gave you? What did you do to make sure your neighbor knew about me? And what are we going to tell them or tell him? There are people right here in our own nation that are in need of missionaries that will go and tell them. And Tanya and I, we're on a journey. Uh, We've just begun yesterday. We uh, moved into our new apartment in Altoona. And our goal is to take the gospel to people in Altoona that have not heard. Uh, There are 1,400 people for every church. And yet, the majority of churches are under 200. There are countless people that are in need of someone to come and tell them. And that is our desire, to go and tell them. You know what? It's not really about starting a new church for us. I mean, that's just what happens when you start telling people about Jesus. The church forms. But it's about making sure that every single person in our generation that are within earshot of us has the opportunity to hear the story of Jesus clearly. And that is our goal. Uh, We are partnering with, there's about 10 to 15 churches in in our district that are partnering with us uh, to come and be a part of what God is doing in Altoona, uh, to begin living as Christ in our community and and reaching out and and building relationships and looking for opportunities uh, to share Christ. And we ask you as a church to partner with us Uh, to realize that we are simply an extension of your church working in Altoona. We need countless people praying. Uh, And if you'd like to join our prayer team, there's a clipboard out in in your entryway. And you can can, uh, put your email address. And once a month, I send out updates of what God is doing in the church and how he is moving. And uh, we realize that 
unless God shows up, we're not even really interested in going. I mean, we're not interested in going. If, if, God, if God doesn't show up before us and start working in the lives of people, then we might as well stay home. And that's where all of us as a team praying and asking God to pour out His Spirit and to go ahead of us and open doors and prepare the way and, and to partner with us financially. And there's also opportunities for people to come for a day and be involved in an outreach or something of that nature. And, um, so I ask you uh, to join our team. But today, if you get nothing else from this message and you forget everything I said about the church plant, I hope that you have become more aware of the lost people that are all around you. Because do you realize as we celebrate missions today that each and every one of us are called to be missionaries? I've often said that if you are a Christian, your prayer is not, God, are you calling me to be a missionary or not? Because you're already called to be a missionary. Your prayer is simply, God, where do you want me to serve as a missionary? And many of us, that location is our workplace or the community that we were born in. And that's okay. And some of us, God will send to far off places. But you know, when God looks down, he doesn't look at, oh, these are my missionaries over here serving around the world and, and these are just normal Christians. No. God looks down and says, you've all been sent. Each and every one of us have people in our life that will only hear the gospel if we take the initiative to start that conversation. And I realize that America is a very difficult place to be a missionary. I've served around the world. I've, I've uh, lived in Africa. I've, I've lived in Asia. I've been on countless mission trips. And it was much easier when I was serving in a Muslim country to share about Jesus because they knew it was different. And I realized that many people in America, while they're growing up totally outside the church, and they have this idea that they know about church and they know about Jesus, and oftentimes when you talk to them, what they think they know isn't really the truth. But it makes it harder to share, but we still have to share. And so I ask you, will you go? Will you be a missionary to reach the people that are right here in our own nation? We certainly thank Reverend Cox for his stirring sermon to us this morning. And uh, we're going to ask you to, to give. We are, as a church, going to support uh, their new work by $1,000. But this morning, we're also going to take a love offering to help cover their expenses getting here, getting back home, and setting up for their new ministry there in Altoona. So we're going to ask the ushers, if they would, to come forward as we take this love offering. We're going to ask Nina if she would come and sing her special for us that we kind of overlooked. And uh, let's just bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your blessings upon our lives. I thank you for your hand upon this young couple, and I pray that as... Richard and Tanya go out, and as they minister in the area of Altoona, that you certainly will show up. We believe that you will. We believe you have your hand upon them. We believe that they sense your calling upon their life. And Father, I just trust that you will just bless and pour out your spirit upon them. May they see many souls, men and women and boys and girls, come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you so much for the call that you've placed upon their life. Bless now this offering as we give it in love towards their support. I trust, Lord, that you will help us to be generous in our giving, realizing that you love a cheerful giver, and for all that you do, we'll praise your name. Amen.